When we consider learning, education, teaching, the classroom, we conjure up ideas of desks in a row, whiteboard behind us, a projector where we can show slide after slide after slide of PowerPoints jammed full of words, even more dense than a textbook. But I'm here to tell you, our classrooms are much more than that. And yes, my classroom and your classroom is universe. I was very fortunate in that I earned that title of Space Cadet at a very early age. In fact, it was a nickname my parents gave to me without telling me about it. <laughs> they told me later on in, um, when I had earned my doctorate that I was a truly a space cadet. But I was also fortunate I grew up in a time when things were happening around me, the space program. When I was in first grade, my teacher rolled in a TV set and said, today, boys and girls, we're gonna watch America launch their first astronaut, Alan Shepard a simple 15 minute flight. But here this little seven year old got charged up about space, went home and started talking about space and how cool it was and how excited he was about it. And his parents just looked at him like, where did this weird kid come from? How could he be interested in space? We have no interest in science, yet our son has this interest all of a sudden in space. I talk so much about it, they decided to buy me for that Christmas my first telescope. A toy telescope they had to save money for, they didn't know what they were buying. Yet, that telescope opened up a brand new classroom for me. It was so poor I could barely see the moon through it. My mom would often regale stories later on in life about how she was afraid I'd freeze going outside looking up, but that was my universe. That was my classroom, was looking up and just studying the moon and seeing how the telescope worked and having little friends come over and look to the telescope with me. But yet my parents couldn't figure me out. Space program continued and I kept clippings of everything that happened. And my dad brought home a cardboard box, a big one, so I could build a little spacecraft to fly along with John Glenn in February of 1962. And I met John Glenn a little bit later on in life as when he was a senator. And I had the honor, absolutely the honor, of spending time with John and Annie Glenn, his wife. Um, when they toured the Science Center I directed, and I'm going to tell you, you talk about humble people, but wonderful. And I told Glenn, I said, I got interested in space because of you. And he said, so did I. So it was kind of an interesting comment. Again, things happened in my universe that continued to direct me. When I was in third grade, our class went to the Jacksonville Children's Museum, and I was interested in all these nice little exhibits, dioramas and things that would be kind of considered boring today. And at the very end of our tour, we went to this domed room that had this odd looking thing in the center that squirted out light and showed stars. It was my classroom, it was the planetarium. I was absolutely fascinated by what I saw above me. I thought, oh my gosh, the heavens. And it's funny because when we face that up, of course you have to go to the gift shop before lunch. And there was all sorts of cool toys. And yes, we even had cool science toys back then. But off in a corner, I found a little, little bowl full of little chips of rocks from space meteorites. And in fact, I still have that first meteorite I spent my milk money on. <laughs> I went home and told my parents, I bought a meteorite with my milk money. I said, boy, we've got a weird one here, don't we? <laughs> but that kind of launched me into a career about space. And I kept talking about the planetarium. So again, my parents saved money. And for Christmas that year, they bought me a little toy planetarium. So then my bedroom, ceiling and walls, became my planetarium, my classroom, my universe. So I would go and I start learning about mythology, not pure science, but mythology about constellations and star patterns and what people saw up there. It was wonderful. I learned about Orion the Hunter and the stars in Orion. I learned about how the Muslims had named certain stars in Orion like Betelgeuse, which means, by the way, armpit if you're curious there. And I learned all about the mythology there. Then I got a chance to go outside and look up. Now in those days, we weren't quite as technologically advanced, so we didn't have as many street lights. So you could see stars from your home. And I'd go out and I could find 
Orion the Hunter, and I saw this grand cloud arching across the sky. It was the Milky Way. And that's something that most Americans have never seen because we all live in these urban settings. Well, I think the way to sum it up is a wonderful poem that's written by Ralph Hogston. I stood and stared, the sky was lit, the sky was stars all over it. I stood, I knew not why, without a wish, without a will. I stood upon that silent hill and stared into the sky until my eyes were blind with stars and still I stared into the sky. And that described that kid back then, described that kid now. Well, and again, things continue to happen in my universe, in my classroom. My parents told me about a bright comet I may be able to see. So I went out in 1965 and saw a comet, Ikea Secchi, great sun grazer. I thought, oh, all comets are like this. They're big and they're bright and they stretch across the sky and are incredible and beautiful. Well, last or not. We learned some lessons about a year ago from a comet named Ison. It was supposed to be the comet of all comets, even brighter than Ikea Secchi. And as he got close to the sun, Ison fell apart and became a dud. But that was our classroom. We as astronomers and scientists learned things. Well, my parents also told me about a meteor shower I'd be able to see in 1966. And it was supposed to peak at like four o'clock in the morning. They were a little reluctant, but they said, why don't you go out and look at the Leonids? So I got up, 12 year old, went out, again, very few street lights, and I looked up and it was raining meteors. I saw 10,000 meteors an hour. It was a storm. It's the best show we've had from the Leonids in like 70 years. And I happened to see it. I thought, oh, all meteor showers are like that. Well, they're not. You know, we talk about, hey, there's 60 or 70. That's pretty cool. Most are like eight or nine meteors an hour. But as a kid, can you imagine seeing the sky rain meteors? It was like a waterfall of these shooting stars coming down over my head. And again, just boosted more of my universe, my classroom. Well, as I continued to move through school, I was delighted to find out when I was in eighth grade, I had to do a science project. And so I decided to take a little bit better telescope I had gotten by then and photograph the moon. So my dad gave me an old camera, that thing you used to put film in. You may remember those things. And so I learned how to use a camera and how to develop film. My pictures were terrible. They were out of focus. I photographed the full moon. It was too bright, but I learned some things. And so I continued working on these sorts of science projects in science experiments. I learned how to make my own telescope, ground my own telescope mirror. So I learned about optics and math. I learned how to build my own telescope tube. So I learned about woodworking, my own telescope mount. So I learned about how you take pipes and make mounting out of pipes. All at the same time, my brothers and sisters were into sports, you know, the normal stuff, the space cadets off making telescopes and grinding mirrors and photographing Jupiter and learning how to work with surfboard type of materials to make cameras. Well, again, I lived at just the right time and a good friend of mine, he and his grandfather were going down to Titusville to see the launch of Apollo 11 and asked me if I wanted to go. I was nine miles away along with a million other people as Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins blasted off to the moon. It was just so incredible. The first launch I ever saw from, from Titusville was the launch of Apollo 11. Watching those three begin that journey in July of 1969 was really one of those highlights. And those of, of us who are alive can never forget those ghostly images on TV as Neil Armstrong came down that ladder and stepped onto the moon. It was just an incredible, incredible experience. I was so elated, I got the courage to say to my dad, hey, what if I build an observatory in our backyard? <laughs> he said, yes, and he said, I want to build a bigger tool house so you can have my tool house and do whatever you need to do to convert it to make it your observatory, put your telescope in. So I took it, the roof loose, which is kind of strange, especially in Florida with hurricanes, made the roof where you can roll it off the side and put a telescope in it. And it became like the neighborhood clubhouse. Parents and their kids would stop by and say, hey, is Mike going to look at the stars tonight? Is he going to look at the moon tonight? So it became like a stopping place for others in their classroom their universe. So it was kind of fun to watch this happen as I just was enjoying the night sky and learning how to use my telescope and finishing up high school. 
Well, another event happened that really did change a lot of my perspective of the universe. In March of 1970, there was a total solar eclipse that was visible way across Georgia. So I asked my parents, can I take the car and a couple friends and the telescope and camera and drive up the way across to watch the eclipse? They said, fine. Well, the weather wasn't real good, so I was learning a little bit about meteorology. And then all of a sudden, this black shadow came racing across the sky. And above me was this beautiful solar corona, or the crown of the sun. I could not believe what I was seeing. It was incredible. And 18 eclipses later, it's still incredible. Every one of them have been different. And you have a chance for your universe to include an eclipse because in 2017, we have an eclipse that passes just north of here in Charleston, South Carolina. You can see the eclipse line. It starts in Oregon and goes through the Midwest on out to sea. Be there. You know, another thing that often people love looking at is Saturn. You know, they look through the telescope and they see Saturn. And they always say, is that real? That can't be. I see these rings and this just can't be real. It's got to be something that's fake. Come on now. Well, I will tell you, it's a real treat. And I can imagine being some of the earlier astronomers, like Galileo thought they were the ears of Saturn, or Dutch astronomer um, Christian Huygens talked about the waters in the gas giant planets being frozen up. This is a mere 350 years ago. We didn't have the equipment at that time. He didn't have the equipment to know what was out there, but yet he was able to kind of think about what it would be and 350 years ago, he talked about what we now know about these moons. Speaking about moons, I was a freshman at a local junior college by the name of Florida Junior College, and there was a total lunar eclipse at 4 o'clock in the morning. So several of my friends and I got together to observe it. Unfortunately, my neighbor across the street called the police because she thought I was looking in her window. <laughs> so the police arrived, and guess what? They were now looking at the eclipse with us. And more police cars started showing up because all these officers want to see the eclipse. Well, the Apollo program began to end and I continued my work through school and I really wanted to be an astronomer, an astronaut. The shuttle would not fly for a number of years and becoming an astronomer was, was a little bit more difficult because of all the push during the 1960s. So I decided to go into teaching. And it was something I just absolutely loved. I loved sharing about the universe. And I would get out and do demonstrations. And I've loved, loved, loved teaching. Teaching high school, teaching in formal science, teaching in college. Because it's just something that I have a passion to share my little piece of the universe with so many other students and so many others who have that interest. Well, I went to graduate school and I ended up getting a doctorate in astronomy and science education, but I went back to that little meteorite. I was very interested in studying meteorites and cratering and have traveled around the world and done that sort of research. And the neat thing about being a meteoriticist is you get to go to some usual, unusual places like the South Pole. I led an expedition there in 2005 looking for Antarctic meteorites and got a whole new appreciation for searches as well as what real cold weather is like. <laughs> and by the way, it is really cold. I did a little shift in my own personal universe in that I decided to try informal science education. I accepted a job as a director of Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland, California, led the effort to build a new facility. But the exciting thing was Oakland is such a diverse area and we got a chance just to bring kids in who'd never even seen a redwood tree. Wasn't trying to make astronomers or astronauts out of them, but just say, this is cool stuff. You can do this if you want to. Even though I never got a chance to fly the shuttle, I have a lot of friends who have, and I've been down to the Cape for launches. And I tell you what, space exploration is something that many of you in this audience will get an opportunity to do. And I just hope I've influenced some students who one of these days will call me from space and say, hey, Dr. Mike, I'm over aboard the space station. I still love sharing the night sky with people. I love going out to church groups or scout groups or even my own students and just showing them the beauties of the night sky. It's a small part of the universe, but it's an important part of the universe. See, each of us, each of us have our own universe. Yours may be art or music or business, speech, 
auto mechanics, you may be a rocket scientist, you may be in the ecology, environmental sciences, English, speech, but each of us have our own universe. And that's an important part of what you do. Thank you so much and keep looking up.